Oh, may I ask what page is this? Uh, 777. Thank you. All right, MS. This is another chronic neurologic disorder. So this will be every chronic condition will have periods of remission. There will be periods of relapsing okay, or what we call exacerbations. So MS is, this is different from Guillain-Barre and myasthenia gravis. So in myasthenia gravis, we had an autoimmune disorder attacking your acetylcholine receptor sites. In Guillain-Barre syndrome, it was a acute um, autoimmune condition resulting from the uh, either a uh, viral infection or from let's say a uh, bacterial infection such as Campylobacter um, and we also had um, flu vaccination okay so some some type of exposure to a virus okay usually so that was the problem in Guillain-Barre in multiple sclerosis we already talked about Guillain-Barre right yes okay so yes in multiple sclerosis this is a whereas in Guillain-Barre there was um patchy um uh, patchy areas of demyelinization. This one is um, is still demyelination. Demyelination. Um, however, this is also uh, autoimmune. So here you will have instead of having resting tremors in like in Parkinson's in multiple sclerosis, you'll have fatigue. You have some pain. You also have uh, intention tremors here because there are patchy plaques all along your nerves caused by demyelination there will be no continuous muscle contraction meaning the impulses cannot be um, cannot be continuous okay unlike in um, myasthenia gravis wherein you had weakness progressive weakness with every repetitive activity this one occurs with any activity there is no progressive um, weakness however there will be severe um, tremors with intention whenever the patient makes a purposeful movement Along with that movement disorder, though, there are other problems associated with MS as a result of the demyelination. I'm not testing the type, like, uh, for instance, um, relapsing, everything. Uh, so we're only discussing this one. Okay, so not the other types, only the relapsing remitting type, because since this is the most common. Now look at the age of incidence it occurs in women 20s and 30s uh, i know it says here twice as um oh yeah it does say uh, more women okay so i was right okay so more women than men and what are you doing when you're in your 20s and 30s which you're at right now so what are you guys doing living our best life running around yeah so you're still trying to you know uh, trying to get to your careers and then pretty soon in a few months you'll be practicing those careers then imagine getting the news of developing this this is a lifelong disorder you can only control it <clears throat> but there is no cure as with any other autoimmune disorder so for this type you'll have good days and then you'll also have bad days so you'll have good periods of remission. However, when exposed to certain things, you will be uh, into relapse. And guess what the trigger is? Stress. And stress is very 
subjective. Uh, nursing school is stressful. Uh, getting pregnant is stressful. Um, having a boyfriend is stressful. Losing one is stressful. Um, again, this is all relative, right? So losing one might not be um, stressful for some of you. Um, so that's what I mean by it's very subjective. Uh, regardless of the stress, however it is perceived, it is a trigger for a um, what is this here? Oh, no, uh, disregard this one. I don't know what this is doing. We're not talking about HNP. Okay, we get that. All right, go back to MS. So your manifestations are, like I said, the patient has tremors. In uh, in addition to that, you'll also have eye uh, symptoms. So you'll have double vision or maybe um, vision loss in one eye. Uh, you have pain. There will be electric shock sensations, uh, tremors, as I already mentioned, uh, along with an unsteady gait. There, you're tired all the time and you may get dizzy. There's also numbness or weakness in one or more limbs. Now imagine having these during an exacerbation. When you have a flare-up, you'll have these symptoms. How can you go to work? How can you attend to your children? Yeah. You can't. All right. So you'll have, this is what's happening to you. You have areas of demyelination. Uh, some areas will be good. You'll have, you still have normal neurons somewhere in your body, but you'll also have uh, demyelinated uh, neurons in other parts of the body. As far as testing, just like any other autoimmune disorder, there's really no one test that will diagnose or rule out um, MS. It's all a matter of clinical manifestations as well as doing other blood tests to rule out other causes. Uh, so as stated here, it can be very difficult to diagnose. You, you might be misdiagnosed for something else and treated for something else before we can get to this diagnosis. As with any other autoimmune disorder, no cure. So all we can do is keep you in remission using medications. So you'll be taking medications daily in order to keep you in remission. During attacks though, obviously the medications you're using every day uh, are not going to be effective during a flare-up because you've been on these medications before the flare-up. So during flare-ups, you'll be taking high-dose steroids in order because it is an autoimmune disorder. So that's the only way we can um, we can control your symptoms during a, a flare-up. So you have increased demyelination. They do get um, they do uh, regenerate. All right. So every time these happen, they regenerate. That's why you have remissions. However, during an attack, so you'll have autoantibodies in your plasma, so they start attacking them again, then you have the symptoms. Let's go to medications now. Your day-to-day -day medications will consist of immunomodulators. So since it's a autoimmune disorder, now we'll have to suppress your immune system. There are different types. We have oral, we have injections. <clears throat> Most of the drugs used are injectables. They are subcutaneous injections, specifically beta interferons. If you recall your... Um, what's happening to Tamara? Is she having internet connections? Max is having internet problems. He can't get back on because there's a thunderstorm that took out his internet. Okay. He's still trying, but it's not letting him. Tammy's not here too, right? I will. Tamara. I'm here, Professor. 
Uh, what are you appearing as? It's, it's, I'm on my phone because I'm driving into work. So it should say my name. Ah, okay. All right. Um, so if you remember, um, remember those interleukins that we, the cytokines that we talked about in RA, responsible for autoimmune symptoms. So this will be similar. So those same interferons, those uh, cytokines will be will have to be suppressed because they're the ones that are producing these responsible for the antibodies attacking your myelin sheet. So the drugs are we have interferons, we have beta interferons and beta one B interferons. The most commonly used are the following: glatiramir and fingolimod. Fingolimod is PO. Glatiramir is a subcutaneous injection. It looks like Lovenox. It's a pre-filled syringe. Uh, has to be refrigerated. Uh, and these are what you take every day. Uh, other options are natalizumab and mitoxantrum. Mitoxantrum, sorry. So um, starting from, I guess, all of them. Beta interferons, latiramir, interferon beta 1b, um, up to metoxantone. Now, these are for the drug itself. These are going to be your maintenance medications to keep your immune system at bay. So you have less autoantibodies produced, no demyelination. Now, of course, the patient will have um other symptoms uh not related to i mean not direct so you might some of the medications will be for supportive treatment let's say for the spasms and the pain you you feel the muscle pain um or even uh, would could you possibly also develop depression as a result of ms yes yeah, so you'll also be on antidepressants also, or if you can't sleep, then you'll also be on sleep aids, right, as a result of the disease. The other medications are muscle relaxants, and you may benefit also from physical therapy. For the pain, you'll probably be given NSAIDs. Um, There's a drug. Okay, here it here there are. Um, here for the pain, uh, you may benefit from NSAIDs or from anticonvulsants. These um, for the bowel and bladder problems, same as Parkinson's. You'll have stool softeners. Here's laxatives if needed. And the steroids here are the only ones used for a flare-up so when you're hospitalized for, for a flare-up you be put on high dose steroids we already mentioned about the muscle relaxants now for exacerbations also if your symptoms are severe you may be given plasma exchanges we already discussed plasmapheresis previously right under lupus maybe or Guillain Barre? Yes. Yes, we did. Okay. Yes, we did. So I'll give you questions again on plasma paresis. So for the drugs, you'll have multiple here. So we already had drugs for Parkinson's. Now you have more for MS. It's a drug, so questions will of course be on either the side effects or your client teaching. Here are your complications. We already mentioned the depression. A uh, patient may be also developing seizures secondary to MS. Uh, this is what you take your muscle relaxants for. Um, 
this is why you need the physical therapy. Um, sexual function is also affected. Uh, again, you are between 20 to 30 years old, so this will contribute to social relationships. Um, pregnancy, let's talk about pregnancy for a minute. You think pregnancy will result in a flare up as well? Yes. Yes, because it's also yes. stress. That's very stressful. So it can cause a flare up at the same time. So that should be something to be considered as well. Uh, please read the other complications on your own. And that's it. I'm saying that's it, like MS is nothing, right? Um, so another sad uh, disorder, chronic autoimmune disorder, no cure. You can only manage it, um, but it's all about managing drug therapy, avoiding stress as much as possible to avoid a flare up then knowing when you need to see the doctor, knowing what your side effects are, um, and then just, uh, it's all about outlook, I guess. I don't know what else to say. I don't know anyone personally who has MS. I've only seen them in hospital patients. Anyone have anything to share about the experience? Anybody know anyone with MS? I do, but I've never really seen her have an exacerbation. Um, but she did mention that after she had a baby, her MS got better. Say again. I have a friend who has MS. Uh -huh. um, I've never seen her during an exacerbation, so I don't oh. really know like what that's like for her. Um, but she did mention that after she had a baby, her MS, like her exacerbations got much better or they were fewer. Oh, okay. Oh, you mean like it, it didn't like cure her? No, it didn't cure her, but she said she felt like, you know, it got better. So she, oh, okay. prior right. to having oh. a baby, I guess like her symptoms were worse. And then after the baby, they were better. She essentially like, had the baby as soon as she found out that she was having a mess because she, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah. She, she didn't know before she was pregnant. No, she didn't. So she had the baby after she found out she had a mess. You know, she was already married and her husband, I guess, and her were waiting. But after the diagnosis, she was like, I want to do it now, you know, when I can still enjoy and spend time with my baby before, I guess, whatever happens, happens. Okay. All right. So as already mentioned, so you, you have your maintenance medications here. And then, like I said, uh, during exacerbation, patients will be given uh, steroids, a lot of steroids. And you already know the complications of steroids, the Cushing syndrome, and all that will come with the, with the drug therapy. All right. And then, again, consider, just like what you shared, consider when and how many babies to have because they are it's not easy being pregnant with ms all right so let's go straight to als this one will be short uh, short because just like these patients lifespan from the from the onset of diagnosis the patient will die from respiratory failure within three to five years we don't know what causes it. Uh, we don't know what's what's wrong. Uh, Amyotrophic a lateral sclerosis. So this one will be affecting the um, motor um, motor neurons, um, which will cause your muscle weakness and atrophy. So because your muscles do not move anymore, because there's no impulses uh, stimulating them. So this is the problem with ALS. Um, and a problem with skeletal muscles in general. So unlike your heart, which can generate its own impulses, our skeletal muscles can't do that. They need constant stimuli before they can move, before you can feel or move anything. Um, the 
age is uh, it varies. We have people who have uh, symptoms developing after 50 or some people have it before they turn 50. I really no question on the pathophysiology just on the clinical manifestations. If you compare MS from ALS, uh, obviously it's obvious to see which one is worse, correct? In ALS, because the prognosis is poor, uh, this will usually involve a lot of, you know, changes in the, you know, in the family dynamics once a diagnosis is made. There are some people who are misdiagnosed. Maybe they may have another disorder and, and not ALS, which is what's possible in other um, cases wherein they have um, they claim to have MS and then I mean ALS and then they got cured um, most probably that wasn't ALS they must have been they must have been misdiagnosed uh, as having as ALS but it wasn't ALS there were 10 patients with one doctor I saw a special on CNN because it was, it earned, you know, um, it earned attention because the doctor was, she was a known neurologist. And then his, um, he claimed to treat 10 of his patients with ALS, which is unheard of in any other part of the world. So the skepticism, you can imagine the skepticism because the, the these patients were not seen by other doctors either. But I um, mean, we're happy for the patients, you know, whatever they had, they, they you know, they got better. Um, but what's even more skeptical is how he treated them. He, he didn't use any medications at all. He just promoted a, a pure organic lifestyle, meaning nothing artificial. Um, they, they can't eat anything processed or have anything uh, in their cupboard that are artificial. So everything was natural. Um, you know, they can only eat what's in, you know, nature, no, no meat. There was no uh, animal fat involved and that's how he, he claimed to have cured them. But again, very skeptical because uh, nobody's seen those patients. Uh, I mean, these are real patients, but uh, again, we, we don't know uh, if they were really having ALS. I won't test you on these uh, diagnostic tests because again, there's no one test. Uh, imagine, look at this list. Okay? They are used more again to rule out other causes before they can conclude that you have ALS. Uh, lumbar puncture may also be used. Again, the EMGs, uh, whatever all these other tests are done, they are not used to diagnose ALS. They're used to uh, rule out other conditions here to rule out other conditions. There's only one drug known, but it's not to cure ALS. Relizol will only slow the degree disease progression, buying the patient time. So it will uh, allow the patient more time with the family before they are intubated. Okay, because uh -huh. the end result here is they'll end up on a ventilator because the, the, the um, diaphragm will eventually go. Um, and of course, at that point, they'll have to be intubated. So the patient will have a choice here. You, they can, you know, do advanced directives. Do they want to be intubated? Because either way, it won't change the outcome. Intubation will just prolong you. I mean, you're there, you're physically there, but then, um, I mean, there's no interaction or anything. Right, because you're you're on a vent uh, for the rest of however long you have. So some patients here have time to prepare, write their advanced directives down. Do they want to be intubated uh, when they come to that point? Um, we don't know. The bad thing about the drug Relizol is it um, it's very harmful to the liver. It's very hepatotoxic. Um, 
So that's the major side effect of the drug. The rest of the treatment are symptomatic, you no know, laxatives, stool softeners, baclofen for the spasms, uh, antidepressants, you know, for for pain, anticholinergics maybe for the drooling. Um, patients will have you no know, sleep problems, so they're all symptomatic. There, but um, this drug again is the only FDA approved drug. But uh, again, it's only for slowing the progression. More like um, delaying, delaying the uh, intubation part uh, of the disease, uh, which is written here, right here, to increase survival, um, um, extend the period without need for ventilator support. Okay. So again, it does not repair neurons. It does not cure the disease. Complications obviously are related to immobility. So you have pressure ulcers, DVT, pneumonia, um, PEs, etc. All related to uh, decreased mobility. All right, and as already mentioned, most of these drugs here are symptomatic relief and this is your only drug related directly to the to the disease and that's it any question uh, so because we're not using diagnosis to rule out is there any specific test that would confirm als the only way is to rule it out look at the list here yeah. under They'll do everything yeah. to see again because there are there. It may be a treatable condition. That's the point of making these diagnostic tests. But if they all check out fine, then they they get to a diagnosis of ALS oh. and give the prognosis to the patient. And it could be you know because until we were sure, it could be something else besides ALS. And for the meds, are you only testing on the Rilizool? Rilizool? Uh, well, the others also, but they, these are already mentioned in MS also. Yeah. Like for muscle relaxants, antidepressants, laxatives. Um, they're similar. Okay. Okay. All right, let's go to spinal cord injury. This is not written in your module. Please add it. A page uh, seven eighty five. Spinal. Okay, thank you. Seven eighty five. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, SCI. We finished traumatic brain injury, and we said that we um, we can assume that there's there may be spinal cord injury as well. We talked about spinal precautions, right? Did we or no? Probably not. No, no. All right, so let's begin with uh, causes of injuries. So it could be any of these uh, similar to the mechanisms involved in traumatic brain injury. So hypertension, extension, hyperflexion, rotation, compression, or penetrating injuries. So you got shot, stabbed in the spine. You fell from six stories up, landed on either your feet or your head, either way, it will cause compression of the vertebr vertebral column, uh, rotation injuries or car accidents, for instance. So your spine and your, as well as your head will be twisted, turned, however you sustain the injury. So the main thing here is 
there's something called spinal shock and spinal cord injury. They're not the same. Spinal shock still has the same symptoms. However, the good thing about spinal shock is it is temporary, meaning your, your spine just literally went into a state of shock, meaning because of the injury, it stopped functioning for a while, but then the patient may recover or the sensory motor function may be restored after 24 to 48 hours. Um, if there is no physical damage to the spinal cord as shown on the MRI or CAT scan, it could be the patient's loss of sensory motor function could very well be spinal shock only, which is good news. However, when the patient has these actual physical evidence of injury to the spinal cord, then it is spinal cord injury. So the sensory motor functions, depending on the level of the injury, are permanent. One thing to know is the spinal cord injury does not have to be severed, doesn't have to be cut for you to lose sensory motor function. As evidenced by these, so there could be just compression, tearing, so none of these say that it was actually severed, right? So there is still injury to the spinal cord. Let's go now to the signs and symptoms. As mentioned, oh, uh, I won't test you on the spinal cord syndromes because there are several. We have, we have one, two, three, four. There's actually six of them, but um, there's four here. Anyway, regardless, I'm not testing the signs and symptoms for cord syndromes. Okay, uh, I'm not testing that one. I'm just testing the level of uh, this patient's symptoms depending on the level of injury. For instance, uh, there is a table later. For instance, if you have a high cervical, let's say C1, T2, uh, C3, or of course above C4, so that would be C1, 2, and 3, patient will have no ability to breathe independently. And they will be quadriplegic or tetraplegic is another term, tetra, 4, so quadri, 4. Um, so patient will be on either a mechanical ventilator or at least on uh, BiPAP or CPAP, okay. Lower thoracic injuries, uh, of course, the patient will be paraplegic, so they may have some control over their arms. The strength, though, and the extent of what they can do with the arms, whether or not they can push themselves on a wheelchair or if they'll rely on a electric, uh, motorized wheelchair, will depend on how, how what level of thoracic injury do they have. Lumbosacral, of course, these are all um, paraplegics, definitely. However, um, they may have problems with bladders and the bowel, so no innervation to the bowel or bladder, so therefore no, uh, no ability to contract them, no peristalsis, they will have to have a GI, a bowel regimen of stool softeners, and if needed, they'll have to do manual disimpaction. And for their bladder, they'll have to straight cath for the rest of their life. Sexual function varies. They may have erection. However, that erection is more reflex. It's not on demand. Okay, it's not through, um, you know, uh, mental um, stimulation, but more on physical now. So it can still be achieved, an erection can still be achieved with uh, manual uh, stimulation, because that will lead to a reflex. Um, again, the, the key word here is there, there will be a reflex erection, and the ejaculation can be unpredictable and it may be mixed with urine at the same time because it's all reflex now. So there could be reflex bladder emptying as well as, as well as reflex ejaculation. So they can still have children. 
I don't know though if they will have any sensation during sex. That one I'm not sure. Because it's all reflex. So to make a diagnosis of the level of injury, obviously we needed the x-ray or at least a CAT scan or MRI would be better. So this is the testable part. Table 37.6, you need to know, well, at what level do they have what function? So C1, C4, patient is quadriplegic. So of course, the higher they go, that means all these below will also be included. Does that make sense? Yes. 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 Okay. So, yeah. So anything below that level, meaning uh, if you read the table, that means this is the best they can do. C1, C4, that's it. Meaning everything else here are also present. Okay. So a uh, question would be, let's say I give you an example. Can a patient with a C6 injury drive a car? No. 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 Yes. They have arm movement? Yeah, they can. They can. Yeah, it is yeah. the 21st century, so we do have vehicle modifications now wherein you can have acceleration and brake controls by hand doesn't have to be the feet i've seen uh, vans like that so they can drive um let's say who can wheel themselves on a wheelchair what say that again professor which patient can wheel themselves on a manual wheelchair so from c6 C C for for sure c7 c8 yeah definitely c7, c7 right yeah. these kinds can do that so this one only says biceps so it didn't mention triceps so it may they may not be very effective with um, pushing themselves forward because that's what you need for maybe they can what about the faster. hand muscles in order to grip what? the wheels professor the hand muscles because it says it only has yeah, some, some function, function of the hand muscles yeah so, so how are they um, able to grip the wheelchair oh yeah you have a point that's there thinking yeah so would it not yeah, be t1 to t5 if you want to go down this one would be normal yeah. but this one also yeah. has some function here so these guys may right. be able to do that maybe not as well but they can no, probably okay, not so no. it's, it's definitely c7 to c8 yeah but they can't i don't think okay. they can uh, compete in the paralympics let's put it that way because there's no way they'll win Okay, There's so no they're able to, but with difficulty? Yeah. Okay. If they don't have a choice. Oh, yeah, that's true. That, that's okay. true. Professor, but if it's a, a electric scooter, it should be okay that's, with that. Okay. Oh, yeah. You only, yeah, you only need your, you know, one finger. finger. Yeah. Right. To push the joystick or a button, right? So would that be C5, C6 with Wait. the motorized? Yeah, because they still have gross arm movements, yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, treatment. Uh, once damage, of course, there's no, we can't grow nerves. Okay, so unfortunately, um, we can have robotic prosthetics. No, they, they have that now, uh, but there's no technology yet or uh, therapy to grow new nerves. So um, no cure, no way to reverse. 
Emergency management are the following. So during the acute stage, ABC, obviously. Um, and then don't forget, there's could be head injury as well. I will talk about the complications next. So here, prior to arrival, uh, of course, the after ABC, the next priority, of course, is to spine, immobilize the spine here to prevent um, further injury or further damage. And one thing, let's talk about the um, complications now. So two complications are, number one, you have neurogenic shock. We concluded that in module one. What are the symptoms of neurogenic shock again? Um, bradycardia. Okay, this is the only shock, remember, that has bradycardia. All other types of shock have tachycardia. All of them have decreased blood pressure, obviously. Um, this patient will also have um, will they have cool, clammy skin or will they? No, have... it will be dry. Right, because they warm, have... dry. Right, because they have vasodilation, right? So they'll yeah. feel warm. They'll actually look good. Um, that's if they have shock. All right. Uh, obviously, if there's no shock, then it's we don't have those. <clears throat> The others are related to immobility. So DBTPE are your most urgent or priority complications. They have it here, PE. And of course, that could start as a DVT. We already discussed management of shock, which are vasopressors. No, um, fluids first, and then vasopressors, anotropics, et cetera. These are your vasopressors, dopamine, norepinephrine, or epinephrine. We already tested these, so I don't think I'm testing them again. We already did them in shock. Okay, so you can disregard table 37.7. But you still need to recognize and identify the image. But no need for the intervention. Again, we already discussed and tested that previously. All right, after the acute stage, meaning we've already applied the um, spinal collar, the, the cervical collar, I mean, um, after that, the patient is out of the, let's say they're stabilized, no more no spinal, no neurogenic shock, no spinal shock. So we're just managing them at home. Uh, or this actually is started in the hospital. So we have a trail, a halo traction device. So this is, of course, so for there is no permanent um, spinal cord uh, loss of uh, sensory motor function here, meaning the patients had spinal shock and then they recover. However, the recovery will take time. So we need to uh, realign the spine. Most commonly used is a halo traction. So this is just like the same concept as the traction you discussed in the leg or arm uh, fractures. When you uh, use uh, external fixation device, so this one is the same. This one is put around the head. We have a picture here. So it's this is your halo traction. We have four rods connected to a fiberglass vest. There is a wrench behind this patient. Not pictured, we don't have a posterior picture. So behind the patient, there's a wrench to remove these here during an emergency. Say patient goes into cardiac arrest, we need to do CPR, the, the vest has to be removed. So we have a wrench attached to the back at all times for that purpose. Now the 
just like any other external fixation device, these are drilled into the bone. In this instance, the skull. So you'll have to do pin, pin site care uh, here using saline. Uh, the old practice was to use hydrogen peroxide, but, but now they only reserve peroxide for um, for actual infections, but uh, routine would be saline. You have to do daily pin site care or as needed. If you see any um, crusting or drainage, and then it's time to change the the, the dressings around them. The dressings is simply dry gauze. So you just wrap it around the site. Some doctors may order a beta dying ointment to retard bacterial growth around the uh, pin insertion site. Uh, but uh, in the absence of that specific order, it's just saline. All right, so the traction obviously is applied only if the patient is in bed. If they're out of bed, if they're ambulating, then the, the weights must be off. We already talked about the shock and the PE, DVT, all right. All right, see so the spinal shock, like I said, this is not shock. This is not neurogenic shock. The patient is temporarily, the keyword here is temporarily, uh, unable to transmit signals to the muscles and organs, so no sensory motor function below the level of injury. The good thing again is this is self-limiting. So this can last anywhere between 24 hours to up to after a few weeks. Then there will be return of function gradually. We already discussed and tested neurogenic shock as well as management. So we'll skip that. This one we haven't yet and we will end here for spinal cord injury. Years later, this is this typically does not occur uh, during the acute episode. So the most common time it occurs is after the first year. So the spinal shock here subsides. Uh, the patient is already at home learning how to live their life uh, differently because this occurs in T5, T6 or above injuries. So are these patients quads or paraplegics? If it's T5, T6, these are paraplegics. Okay, paraplegics. Um, I, so after the first year, they as they heal, so of course these are these people are back to whatever they were doing. Of course, at a different level now, uh, relatively different. So they have they have a wheelchair, and these are. What age are usually uh, paraplegics? Are these old people? Oh, they're young people. Yeah, these are young yeah. people. So they're young, active. So they still party. Okay, they can still, um, you know, attend parties. They still drink, smoke, uh, just like regular people their age. Okay, just without, you know, the benefit of walking. Okay. Um, because of that, so remember, they have bowel and bladder problems, right? Because it's T5, T6. So can they urinate independently? No. No. So there's no sensation below the, the diaphragm, pretty much. Okay, so they have no bladder or bowel sensation or control. All they have below the diaphragm are spasms. Okay? They have pain, they'll have the spasmic, spastic pain, you know, they'll have spastic movements, but no voluntary movements. So can they feel if they have a fecal impaction or a urinary retention? No. 
No. Okay. Oh. So um, they typically self cast. Okay. So they, they do self cast every now and then. But sometimes because they're still learning. So this is after the first year. So let's say they've never had this condition before. So they were not aware of what exactly triggers this. This is an emergency. This is a life threatening condition. The the trigger here are the following. See the highlighted section? Pain, distended bladder, rapid temperature changes, infection, which includes a UTI. Can these patients have a UTI if they frequently straight cap? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And they, again, yes. won't have pain. There will be pain, but then can they feel the pain? No. Mm -hmm. No. So, however, doesn't mean that the stimulus wasn't there. So the stimulus okay. is there. So let's say they're sitting down, right? Since you cannot feel anything below your diaphragm, below your waist. Can you, can these guys, let's say this is a male patient. Can he feel if he's sitting on his testicles? No. 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 Is that painful otherwise? It's supposed to. Yes, but he cannot feel the pain. So therefore that triggers a painful episode. The um, remember the spinal shock here subsides. There will be some input because are these when you have a full bladder, a full rectum, or let's say somebody kicked your testicles, does that is that something you can ignore? No. Let's say you have no. a full bladder. You've been holding it for six hours because you're stuck in the train. Can you ignore these sensations? No, no, these sensory inputs are so strong, you cannot ignore them. So although there is no motor movement because of the intensity of these sensations, the input travels up the spinal cord and causes a massive sympathetic surge causing. So what is the effect of a massive sympathetic response? Increased uh, heart, high, heart blood rate, blood pressure. pressure. Blood pressure will be really high here. So this will result in widespread vasoconstriction, causing severe hypertension. Professor? Yes. Angelica is uh, stuck outside. She was kicked out of the network. Um, I don't see anyone in the lobby. And I didn't hear a what well, I do now. Yeah, I hear it, but thank you. Oh, she's dead. All right. Uh, however, uh, just like in um, neuro neurogenic shock, we're in. Was there tachycardia in neurogenic shock? No, it's a brain no. cardia. No. Yeah. Same thing here. In uh, new, uh, autonomic dysreflexia, there will also be bradycardia. I don't know why they included tachycardia here. Because all other textbooks show bradycardia. Uh, I can't explain why there would be tachycardia. Um, because again, no textbook, no other author mentions that. In autonomic dysreflexia, these are your clinical manifestations. Again, do not include tachycardia, all right? Because uh, I've never seen that in any other textbook. So again, remember questions on exam is uh, because you don't want to deal with it because it's uh, life threatening. The patient could have a hemorrhagic stroke as a result uh, and die right there. Um, so you need to do prevention. So again, the causes are the following. Okay, uh, but be aware also that pain may be from a crushed testicle or from a pressure ulcer as well. Remember that there is pain sensation there. The patient just cannot feel it, right? You have so if you have this patient has a severe stage three or stage four pressure ulcer, for instance, that is also a trigger. All right.
So these are your prevention, of course. You don't want a full bladder, no full rectum. It happens when usually when the patients have too much to drink because they are paraplegic, but they're not dead. Okay, so they do attend parties, they drink, okay, they, they eat, you know, just like any other, they do drugs, okay? So just like any other person. However, you know, when you're under drugs or when you're drunk, do you still remember to self cath and stuff? No. No, plus, no. Remember, yeah, remember, they cannot feel that their bladder is full. Okay, they can only do it, you know, just because they can, they have to do it. Okay, that's why they, they do it regularly, they self cap. But once you're under the influence and all, and all that, so they may develop this without knowing it. The okay, next thing they know, they do feel the, the headache. Okay, they do feel this. So when they have a severe headache, uh, of course, that already means that the blood pressure is so high, right? Because normally hypertension has no symptom, right? Unless it's really high. So the severe headache here, the diaphoresis, and the flushing. Funny thing is, these only occur above the level of injury. So it will only occur, let's say if this patient has T6, it will only occur at T6 and above. There is no pallor or diaphoresis in the, I uh, know, no flushing below the level of injury. So instead, below the level of injury, you'll have pallor. So other causes are, again, the full bladder, bowel, uh, tight clothing can also do it. Uh, DBTs, pressure ulcer, like I mentioned. Because um, again, they don't have a, um, you know, they have no sensation. So typically, they're not aware of these, um, of these triggers. Like wearing a tight clothing, for instance, <coughs> they, there's no way they can feel that a clothing is tight. Right, and then they have pressure ulcers. They they have no idea. You know, I mean, they're probably aware that they have a pressure ulcer, but they can't feel it. Much more so the bladder or kidney infection. So what do we do? This is a emergency. So therefore, here you have a uh, emergency treatment. First thing is to sit the patient up. I know this thing here starts with monitor blood pressure, so this uh, and then administer. That's usually not your first intervention because, of course, you you have to uh, check the blood pressure, right, to confirm your suspicion that they're having AD. Uh, however, once identified, your first intervention really is to sit the patient up. If you remember hypertensive crisis, this was the first intervention, right, under hypertension in the previous semester two semesters ago. The yeah. first intervention for hypertensive crisis was place the patient in a sitting position. So you do the same. So as soon as you identify the condition, oh, it's a, you know, this is autonomic dysplexia, which basically is severe hypertension. So you put this patient up in a sitting position that already starts dropping the blood pressure, thereby preventing a hemorrhagic stroke. And then find and treat the cause. So look for the cause. So again, number one cause, what was the most common trigger as mentioned here? It's usually a full bladder, right? That's the most common symptom right here. Most common frequent cause is a full bladder. Second is a full bowel. Hopefully it's just a full bladder because if it's a full bowel, then you'll have to go in there. You know what I mean? Yep, yeah, but do so, of course, bring a lots of lubricant, okay? Okay, yeah. Then uh, if those two check out, then look for other causes. Maybe the patient's sitting on his testicles, okay? Maybe it's the uh, clothing, okay? Something he's wearing that's, you know, causing the uh, restriction, uh, you know, a, the, something constrictive clothing or could be a painful source or something. Um, all right, so look for the uh, the trigger. And then once identified, you of course eliminate the trigger. Um, so I would say first step would be put the patient on a sitting position, then administer the drug used here is usually, uh, the choice is either labetalol or 
um, hydralazine because hydralazine is a ganglionic blocking agent, which is what's really triggering this thing. Uh, so between labidolol or hydralazine, but um, uh, in, by experience, it's always been labidolol. Just like hypertensive crisis, it was also labidolol or any of the non-HDP calcium channel blockers like uh, amlodipine, nicardipine. Okay, for the traction, you have here your pins tight care. As already mentioned, we use saline right here. Pin sites, pin site care will be gauze uh, moistened with saline. Here, if you see crusting, so soak that. Uh, same thing here. Um, I did mention that, yeah, hydrogen peroxide should not be used. Um, remember this is traction okay so you need the weight applied and that the the rods or the pins are intact that they're tight because otherwise what's the purpose of the traction there is no traction if they're loose okay and then these are obviously infection redness swelling drainage And all right, and then if these are present, then that means we have no traction, we have no adequate traction. So a doctor needs to be notified so we can he can adjust it. Yeah. And the rest are uh, pressure ulcers, obviously, because of immobility. It's hard to swallow if your neck is in a... Have you noticed that? Especially if you... Have you ever woken up with a stiff neck? Yes. Did yeah. you notice that it's really hard to swallow? It is. Yeah, when you have it in a certain position, it's very, it's very hard to swallow. It's Um, I'm, I have no questions on surgery. So these are involving um, decompression surgeries. Cliff, cliff is uh, I forgot cliff. Lumbar interbody posterior lumbar interbody fusion. Yeah. So we they can have fusion surgeries or let's say um, decompression surgeries uh, for any spinal injury. We already know these. This is just li listed by system. And that's it. So I don't think I can do PE anymore. So your exam will be all neuro, I guess. So it'll be from brain injury, IC, increased ICP, and we have the chronic neuro problems, namely Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, MS, ALS, and then spinal cord injury. All right. So we'll move the gas exchange questions to exam four. Professor, but next week we have a still quiz, right? Not exam. Or we have exam.